That's good stuff. Isn't that cool? If you don't know what those are for, just ask the person next to you. Let me help you out. How's everybody? I have never been so excited and more uncomfortable in my life. <laughs> they say you don't grow in your comfort zone, so by noon I'm looking to be about 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> hey, before we get going, the first thing I need to do is thank my boss, Pastor Jeff. He's not here with us today in the room, but he's on the other side of the lens. And brother, I can't tell you how much it means. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, I, not that fast. I can't tell you how much it means to me that you would trust me to do this, to, to handle the word of God, you guys. If you knew where I've been, that I'm standing here today. Here it comes. Hold on a second. <laughs> to be extended this opportunity, uh, the, reason, the way we got here was because, you know, uh, the same God who sent his son to this earth to perform a bunch of miracles is still doing it. And I'm one of those because there's a lot of reasons why I shouldn't be here, but there's only one uh, reason why I am. And that's Jesus and the transforming work that he does. Somebody say amen. 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 Hey, this is not in my text, so i got to move quick on this, but I'm probably going to talk fast all morning, so just stay with me. Um, Wednesday morning, I had a breakthrough. Um, oh, man. You can laugh. It's okay. I don't stand still very well either. I had a breakthrough Wednesday morning. My brother travels a bunch. So I jump at every chance I get to meet with him. And we had coffee Wednesday morning. This is going to be worth it, I promise, because it's about Jesus, not me this time. Um, we had coffee, and he said, man, how's the message going? And I talked through it a little bit, and I gave him a little, a little spiel, and he talked about how things were going at work. And, and, uh, and he stopped me after about two minutes, and he said, I like it. He goes, that's, that's, that's good, Jared. You're going to do great. He goes, let me encourage you in one thing. He said, people love to identify with your brokenness and your humility and your vulnerability, but if you're not careful, you camp out there so comfortably that people don't see Jesus. And I went, wow. Church, when I left the fire department in 2011, I had no idea that I took a backpack with me full of rocks. And every rock's got some kind of different guilt or shame or brokenness or something I'm not proud of. And in the six years that I've been here, I've qualified myself to stand before you and be worthy by carrying around my bag. Like, make sure that like, I'm worthy to be on this team and be before you. And there's a problem when that happens. When I do that, I take the attention off of Jesus and I put it on myself. And so I've had this breakthrough, and I've been offloading rocks all week long since Wednesday morning. I've been chucking them at people. <laughs> We're not to repay wrongs for wrongs. We're going to get to that later. I've been letting them fall off. And so I want you to hold me accountable, not just today, but tomorrow and the next day after that and however long they let me keep doing this gig. Hold me accountable and let me live in my vulnerability and share what God's done in my life, but don't let me do it without telling you about where Jesus has taken me because I'm not the man I want to be just yet, but I'm also not who I've been. Woo, I'm preaching now. <laughs> How'd we get here? How'd we get to where this emotional guy is doing this? What's the goal? Hey, what's the goal when this guy preaches, right? What should we expect? Some of you are thinking it. You might not be saying it, but you're thinking it. It's the same as it always is, that the word of God would be proclaimed and be taught, that we would open the word, and that we would all, pastors, everyone, 80 and 8, that we would all sit beneath the teachings of Jesus, Paul in this case, from Jesus, that we would all continue to be learners and let God speak to us today. That we would teach all of scripture and that we would let it just speak and do what it does because it doesn't return a void. So if you're a believer, take some steps forward today. If you're an unbeliever, hey, gather research, gather information. I'm going to talk more about that later, but you got a really big decision to make, so make sure you listen closely. We need to recap. Hold on. Just, you guys talk about yourself. I better not put that back in that pile. Um... We need to recap. Okay, so we're in the book of Colossians. Our lead pastor, Jeff, has been on sabbatical, if you're new with us. Um, he's been on sabbatical, and so several of us pastors have been filling the pulpit. We started off, Colossians is this, first of all, know that it's one of four prison epistles that Paul wrote, okay? Um, so Paul has been with Jesus. Jesus has been resurrected. He's teaching at some 20, 30 years later, maybe. Josh told me that because I'm not that smart. Um, but he's teaching the gospel message, and he's imprisoned. He's teaching the message, and it's costing him dearly. Um, and there's this group that he's specifically talking. So he's talking to Christians. He's preaching to Christians as he's writing this. But he's also doing it because just like today when we see things infiltrate the church and we see things infiltrate the word of God and people add things to it and they try to change it, it was happening clear back when Paul was in prison. This group was called the Gnostics. Okay. Now, the Gnostics were these people that had, they thought they had higher powers. They had supernatural ability to understand matters of salvation. Can you imagine living with people who think they know everything? 
So that's who Paul's kind of speaking in the gap of. So uh, Colossians, right, we start with the supremacy of Christ, who he is, the deity of the Christ, all of these things. And then we talk about like what it means to die to yourself and be alive in Christ. And that's things that we say really comfortable as Christians, but people on the outside are like, what is it? How do you die to Christ and come alive? What? Who? What? Well, as Colossians goes on, it kind of unpacks that. It talks about being free from human rules. Kurt did a great job of preaching to us about, is Jesus who he said he was, right? Like he's a really nice guy, did some really cool things. But was he the Messiah? Then we move in, so that's kind of more cerebral part of of Colossians. And then we get into the more practical piece. They had the smart guys do the front end, and then they brought me in when you role play. So so then it gets a little bit more practical. In the last couple weeks, Josh has been preaching about here's what it actually looks like to step into Jesus, right? First off, you have to step out of things. You've got to step away from things. When you were in your flesh, you lived like this. You had no barometer for who you were supposed to be. So when you're alive in Christ... When you're dead, this is the things you're stepping away from. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry. These things, we live in these things prior to Christ. That's our flesh. That's our brokenness. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. And you can't just step away from something. You have to step into something else. Because think about your yard. You get a dead spot in your yard. It doesn't just stay dirt, right? What happens? Let's talk. I feel like I'm by myself up here. Weeds, right? Weeds show up. You either put new grass seed in there or weeds show up. Well, as Christians, we're the same way. You can't just step out of something else without putting something in its place. And a great place to start is the Word of God. I neglected that for a lot of years. I was a Christian by verbal admission, but I didn't read the Word of God. You realize that's a thing? People do that. I did that. So we step away from these things. And the things that we clothe ourselves with, right, are things like compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Oh, and there's a big one. This one's not in my text today. This was in Josh's text, but we've got to bounce back here. Forgiveness. Can we pull this up, Matthew? One of the things that you need to step out of is being unforgiven. Me too. Look at this passage out of Matthew. For if you forgive other people, so there's an if there, so you might not, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if, because there's an option, you do not forgive other sins, others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. You know, I think a lot of us, we talk like we walk around with this list in our pocket of things that are like, well, I'm not going to ask Jesus when I get up there because I just don't understand that. Right? I think we're going to fall face down, right? Because we're not even going to be able to look at him. He's going to be so amazing. But in the event that we get like an entrance exam, you know, some are getting an exit interview, but in the, ha, that landed, first service, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I know I lost my place. You guys talk about your sin pattern. Um, forgiveness. Yeah. This one's not subjective, you guys. This one's very clear. There's a lot of things in Scripture where, yeah, it, it, we, it, it's tougher to, to palate and swallow and digest. This one's not. You want your Father in heaven to forgive you? You need to forgive. And here's the thing about forgiveness. Some of you know this. The trick about forgiveness is that, first, the enemy gets you to think that it's yours to wield. Like, like you got the patent on that. It's yours to, like, who you're going to decide to forgive and who you're not. And me too. Please know this as I preach this morning. I've been living with this text for like three months. And it's been teaching me and it's been calling me out and calling me up. And so everything I speak to you today, I speak to myself. And let me never forget to sit underneath God's teaching right alongside you and continue to learn what he has to say. But here's the thing about forgiveness. You, we hold on to that because we think it's ours. And in doing so, it's that little thing that like we hear people say, like you're drinking poison expecting somebody else to get sick. What happens with that little seed of unforgiveness that you hold on to, it ends up sprouting. And it's this thing called bitterness. And when you become bitter, that is, that is a sure barometer that you, are, you have graduated from being unforgiven. You're now bitter, and you are a good distance away from who Jesus is. right? And we know what it looks like to live in him, to step out of things and clothe ourselves. We tracking? Some, did somebody say yes? Okay, all right, here we go. Um, so now we hit this part where we're going to role play. Okay, so we've had a lot of teaching up to this point, and now we're going to talk to husbands, we're going to talk to wives, children, parents, we're going to talk to slaves, masters, meaning as Christians, because Paul's talking to Christians here, we are all slaves to our master in heaven. That's one of our texts today. And can we pray? I don't want to dive into this without praying. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and your grace. You are the perfect balance of, Father, conviction coupled with grace and mercy. Would we hear from you today? Would you do everything, Father, in your power? In my weakness, Father, would you be mighty and strong and communicate a message to each and every one of us 
that moves us forward in our sanctification and draws us closer to the person of Jesus. We pray these things and all God's people said. Okay, here we go. Instructions for Christian households. Something I need to say to you right quick. The title of this message is Rules of Engagement. Now, I gave Jeff four options that I went with, and he said, I like all those. He goes, I'd probably use that one last, and here we are. The reason for that is because I'm a little bit of a a rebel spirit in me, and like the world has taken a lot of words and put their own definition on them. They've gotten, you know what I mean? They're stepping out of their lane, and we get offended by this word rules or like instructions, you know? Well, Jesus... Like his rules, his teaching, his instructions, his rail systems, whatever word you want to put on it, like they're not to oppress us, church. It's to set us free. That's a great list of rules. They're not to hold us down. They're not to take something from us. It's to give us something. It's to give us life because we're dead in our sins prior to who he is. Okay, here we go. Colossians 3.18. We'll pull it up on the screen here. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. How offensive is that? (laughs) Right? Especially today. Tell somebody to submit to somebody else, let alone tell a woman to submit to a man. Did he just say that? No, he didn't. Paul said it. (laughs) Paul said that. Paul said that. He said, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Fitting in the Lord. That means that that posture is fitting in the Lord. The Lord likes that. He's glorified in that. We get offended too easy, church. One of the first things you can do, this is really not part of the text, but I mean, we're going to talk about words today like submissive and obedience and like master and slave, and I'm going to put good context to that. One of the first things you can do to step into a lot of joy, if you're missing some joy and some contentment and some peace in your life, is stop giving people the opportunity to offend you. Stop handing that over. Me too. That's something that you possess and you give it to somebody. When I read this, i got to step into this story. I'm the husband. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And the first thing I asked myself three months ago when I started laboring into this text was, man... Am I somebody my wife should be submitting to? Ooh. Better today than a few days ago. Husbands, are we someone that our wives should be submitting to? If we know what that looks like, if we know what's submitting as a Christian man and who that guy is, guys, are we, are we that person? <laughs> you tell him, girl. I hear you, I hear you. I'm going to offend everybody today. I love when Pastor Jeff says that. Everybody's getting offended today. I've been being offended for two or three months here, like getting my stuff called out here. Here's the deal. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. Who knows what Zubilee is? Uh Uh-oh. Where's he going? I know what it's like to get drunk at Zubilee. Get so drunk that I humiliated my wife in front of her previous classmates. I borrowed a phone off of a stranger because I lost mine. I didn't know where it was. I called my brother at 2 a.m., to come pick me up from Zubilee, I was sitting next to some bronze ducks out in front by a koi pond. <laughs> he came and picked me up. He took me home. I passed out on my deck. My wife got home. I don't remember a lot of the conversation, but she said it did not go well. <laughs> True story. And a handful of others just like it. Next morning, woke up. Had a really healthy conversation. Can you imagine? The filthy language that I used, everything else, and living in my sin. Here's the kicker, and I remember this. It was a moment. I remember some of them. Within a matter of moments, I have two little kids at the same time. I'm trying to correct these two for bad behavior. I'm literally trying to correct my kids for bad behavior, and I'm asking myself as I read this, are we... Someone that our wife should be submitting to. I wasn't. But I told you to hold me accountable. I'm not all the way where I'm going, but I'm not where I was. And that's not who I am anymore. And it's not because of me. It's because of Jesus. Because I tried to change and I couldn't. But he changed me. Wives, here it comes. Here it comes. Have you left room to be submissive to your husband? Is there any room left? Is there any room left in the relationship to be submissive to your husband? Nope. Somebody said no. I know he maybe doesn't, not the man that he wants to be, but if you've seen a road of progression, if you see somebody fighting for spiritual sobriety in your husband, is there room, is there safe room to still be submissive because it's fitting in the Lord? And maybe you showing just an appropriate amount of submission in this season in his life is maybe the thing that he needs to take the next step. 
Maybe it's the unconditional love that he needs to see the father through his wife. Man, I've seen Jesus through my wife so much, church. A long ways from my napkins over here. (laughs) My wife figured out a way because of her prayer life and because of her relationship how to submit in an appropriate way when I wasn't that guy. We've been together since we were 16. And it's because of what God has done through her. Because she had a, a submissive spirit. And he gave something to her that she didn't have at the time when she needed it. Proverbs 18, 22. Can we pull that up? <coughs> he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Guys, husbands, can we say amen? Amen. amen? amen. Wives, are you good? Because the Lord says you are. Colossians three nineteen. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. We need to look at another scripture to understand the kind of love we're talking about here. So we're going to pull up Ephesians 5.25. And it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a serious kind of love, husbands, that the Lord expects from us. First and foremost, one of my old captains at the fire station, he was here for service supporting me. Great brother in the faith. I, I put two and two together. I think what was happening was he used to say this thing all the time at the fire station. We would talk to each other. You know, we, we've been friends for a very long time about our marriages and things. And I think what would happen when he would talk about him and his wife, Rini, uh, he would reference, like, we'd be talking about things, and he'd say, well, you know, we, our, our situation, our, our conversation kind of got crossed. She was mad at me. I put my foot in my mouth, this and that, whatever. And uh, I think what was happening was when he was losing ground in the conversation, he would default to this. Well, you just got to submit to me. Woman, I got to die for you. <laughs> and uh, according to the Scripture... It's not entirely wrong. I mean, I think context matters, right? Let's get to the back half of that passage. Just as Christ loved the church, that was in the wrong verse. Wives, do not be harsh with them. I am a, uh, I'm a temporaholic. I'm probably going to lose some stock with some of you, and I, and I get it. I have a raging temper, church. I can go from zero to 60 like that. I know what it's like to scream at my wife at the top of my voice, and she's right next to me in the car. Squeal in the driveway, just about take out the garage door, slam the doors. I know how to patch sheetrock because I put my fist through it. That is not the kind of love that Jesus had for his church. That's a hard guy to be submissive to. I know what it's like to be harsh. And just the way an alcoholic, and I say this with absolute sensitivity, 20 years sober, they identify as an alcoholic because they wake up every day and they make the decision to continue being sober. And I wake up every day and I continue to make the decision to not be a harsh husband. And I celebrate just like I told you because I'm not who I want to be just yet, but I'm not who I've been. Jesus has done a great work in me when it comes to my temper. And I called myself a Christian the entire time. I called myself a Christian the entire time, but didn't read scriptures very well, didn't open my Bible very often. We better keep moving. Colossians 3, 20 and 21. We're going to jump into this passage here, and it's talking about children and parents. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. The Greek word for children, let's start off here with this one, is tekna, T-E-K-N-A. It means little children living in the home. And it has zero reference to anything that I'm talking about. I just hear pastors do that up here. They reach back and grab a Greek word, and then everybody's like, this guy's deep. (laughs) Absolutely nothing for you there. (laughs) What I would point out is the word obey. We're at another one of those offensive words. We started with submit, now we're at obey. Obey is not a bad thing. Children, obey your parents and everything. Obedience leads to righteousness. Eric preached about this a few weeks ago, paraphrasing there out of the book of Romans chapter 6. Obedience leads to righteousness. So why is obedience bad? Well, let's check out righteousness and make sure that's something we want. The quality of being made morally right or justifiable. Who doesn't want to be morally right or justifiable before the Lord? So why are we so bothered by being obedient? When does obedience serve somebody poorly? When does reading the instructions on that Christmas gift for your kid not ending up with a bunch of parts at the end? When does that serve you poorly? 
Obedience is not a bad thing. Neither are the Lord's instructions. Verse 21 says, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. You can swap father for parents here. Some of your translations probably say, did I tell you guys to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3? You guys are there? Thank you. You can swap fathers and parents here. Fathers is just referencing in Rome, the, the father was the vested authority in the home, and so that's how that was written. But some translations say parents, and we can clearly say that without changing the word. The thing with parenting is we get the last word. And if we're not careful, we can do that in a self-serving way. But as parents, to be fitting in the Lord, we're not serving self. We're serving anybody? You guys got to talk to me. I'm super lonely up here. We're serving God. We can't be motivated by anything else. And if you think about the book of Matthew, what Jesus says about the little ones there, he says, any one of you that would lead these little ones astray, you'd be better off to tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown in the depths of the sea. Like this parenting thing and these little people and how we lead them and what we lead them towards and against and what we leave them subject to, like it's a big deal. According to Scripture, it's a really big deal. There's a quote from Robert W. Wall. I read a couple... Uh, a couple commentaries on Colossians trying to prepare for this message. This quote says, In Western countries, nearly every week, some national magazine is publishing yet another report that makes this point typically stated negatively. The decline of the family is the surest barometer of the decline of the culture. Ooh. We could pull up Luke chapter 11, 17. It says it this way, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. We don't have to look very far to see houses being divided and falling. It's not just happening in the news. It's not just happening in some other house in the city. It's happening in our church. It's the reality. Colossians 3, 22 through 24. This is a little bit of a longer passage. We'll go with three verses here. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor. Everybody say, curry their favor. Curry their favor. I've never seen that word before. I just want you guys to have to say it too. <laughs> but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. First and foremost, when we're talking about masters and slaves here, those are very sensitive terms, and as they should be, we're, talking, we're not talking about the antebellum American slaves here. We're talking about the sl master and slave relationship between having a heavenly father and we are slaves to Christ and his ways. You ever notice how a lot of inspirational quotes look a lot like Scripture sometimes? Nobody noticed that? I'm not picking on John Wooden. I think it's a great quote. I love inspirational quotes. Legendary, famous basketball coach for the UCLA Bruins. The true test of a man's character is what he does when no one is watching. That's great. That's scripture. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart. We're doing things for reverence to the Lord. The motive cannot be for the applause of men. That runs out. Our posture has to be because we're being submissive and obedient. Those offensive things to Jesus, to the life that he gives, the one that's full of life, not death. Verse 23 says, and we see this language a couple times in Colossians, and there's another place in Scripture, but I looked and I couldn't found it, but Josh told me it was there. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Right? There's another one. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. It's about Christ-like character, not just character when nobody's watching. What, what good does it do to pull the wool over somebody's eyes who's watching you, you know? Gain the favor of someone when the only person that really matters sees everything, right? Think about it this way, right? Our motives for what we're doing. Think about what the scriptures say about fasting, right? Fasting. Don't have your face all downcast. Put oil on your head. Keep your chin up. Father knows what you're up to. This is between you and him. Or praying. Think about praying. Go into your private space. Go into your closet, right? Your father's aware of what's going on there. You don't have to do it to... I've been praying for the last year and a half more in public than I have been in private. That's pretty sobering. Wait, you're a pastor. I know. Trust me, I know. The way it talks about giving. Your right hand and your left hand. Let your right hand see what your left hand is doing. The father sees what's done in secret. Our motive, doing things for the applause of men... 
our motive to try to curry the favor for something ultimately is pointless because our motive should be positioned to please the Father. Colossians 3.25, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. This is another one of those verses that leaves no room for misinterpretation. And I know, church, I'm 45. The world has given me really great reasons to settle the score, to not forgive some people. It's done the same thing to me it's done to you. It hurts, doesn't it? Amen. But you can't misinterpret this. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, Romans says. Let me ask you, on forgiveness and on like wrongs, taking that, those matters into our own hands, how do you take matters into your own hands and, and serve Jesus at the same time according to the Scripture? I'd go a step further and say, how do you follow Jesus and sin at the same time? You don't. You don't follow Jesus in the act of sinning. You're choosing not to. The scripture is very clear. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. We've got to be submissive here and obedient and trust God and align ourselves with scripture. Colossians 4.1. This, uh, this is our final verse as we walk through our text today. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. That, that verse all by itself sums up everything we've spoken about. It sums up the entire passage. It doesn't matter, church, what our role is. It doesn't matter if you're a husband, if you're a wife, if you're a child, if you're a parent. If you're a student or a teacher or an employee or a boss or you own your own company. As Christians, and Paul is talking to the Christians here, we have a master in heaven that we need to ultimately be submissive to. All of us have different positions of authority. And all of us have different positions of being subordinate. And all those things I just listed. But again, if we look at the definition of a Christian and the things we step away from and the things that we clothe ourselves with, you know one thing that has to be there for all of this to work? For everything we've talked about today, for every passage to pan out, one thing has to be present. It's the secret ingredient. Anybody? Jesus. <laughs> Correct. I knew somebody was going to do that to me. Dang it, Jared. <laughs> it's humility. You can't pull any of this off without humility. You can't be submissive, right, without humility. You can't be obedient without humility. You can't trust God with forgiveness, settling the score, dealing with wrong, without having humility. Isn't it the gospel message? It's the person of Jesus. You've got the person with absolute all authority who's bound and answers to no one but the Father. And what does he do? He submits himself to the Father's will. Comes down here, is obedient even to death on a cross. The greatest show of humility. It's literally the gospel message, the posture that we have to have to walk through this text can't be pulled off without humility. And can I just say, church, one of the things that burdens me so much the further I get down my road, walking with the Lord and pursuing Him, I am meeting more and more people that are making their decision about Jesus based upon the church's broken illustration of who He is. And you think, well, that ain't my responsibility. No, it's not all our responsibility. People's choice is not all our responsibility as Christians. But the text makes it clear that we're not dismissed from being responsible. Unbelievers don't get their definition of Jesus from Scripture. They're deciding who He is by looking at the church. 
And I'm going to speak out of both sides of my mouth because that weighs on me. And at the same time, I would say to you, if you're an unbeliever here today, if you're in this room or if you're watching, I, I, I so humbly and, and I, with, with sincerity invite conversation. Please don't make your decision about your eternity based on how well I'm doing because he, di- he died for me. Oh, I'm a pastor. I put buttons on today. And my most righteous acts are filthy rags. He had to, he had to come and, and, and he, had to, he had to pay the highest price. We sang it. Jesus paid it all. He had to come get, come get me. And it cost him a lot. Don't make your decision if you're an unbeliever. And you could, be, you could be sitting in church in this setting on Sundays for 20 years and you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and then told somebody about it. We spend a lot of time and a lot of energy and we spend a lot of resources We gather information and data to make good, informed decisions about things that are ultimately going to just rust away. And I'm afraid that some people are doing this much work leaning into who Jesus is to make a decision that's this big. If you're an unbeliever today, I I would just honestly just ask you and, and plead with you, put forth a really solid effort to figure out who Jesus is and not just by the way the church is representing him but by the way the, way the word of God tells you who he is I've thought this for a long time and I'm, I'm, I didn't think of it first surely and, and I want to say it humbly like with love If I get this wrong, if I get this wrong, I spent my life trying to be kind instead of angry and mean. I spent my life trying to learn how to give and be generous rather than to be greedy and envious. I spent my my life trying to learn how to love my wife like Christ loved the church. I spent my life trying to learn how to forgive people so I don't become toxic and bitter. If I get this wrong... I don't lose anything. But if you have not dealt with this Jesus thing, if you get it wrong, I would just ask you, how much did you risk? Because you will have lost everything. If this text is right, you will have lost everything. And I'm I'm learning what it feels like to break for that kind of thing. And I'm not all the way there because plenty of time I want to go do my own thing. But I'm breaking more and more because it's a really big deal and there are a lot of people that aren't even giving it a solid look. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your humility. Thank you, Father, for giving us instructions and rail systems around us that give us life. They give things to us. They don't take things from us. Thank you that you didn't entrust the really important part to us, Father, because we're we're broken as you mold and shape us. We're still broken, but that, that heart posture, that heart transformation, Father, would you continue to do a great work in that space? Thank you for loving us so much that even in our brokenness and our imperfection, even in the struggle, even as we fight for spiritual sobriety in our marriages, in our parenting, and in our lives, and our ability to be submissive to our Heavenly Father, even as we live our lives out on that battleground, you came after us in the name of Jesus, and you dealt with every single bit of it. And we love you and we're forever grateful. And we live from that place. We pray these things in Jesus' name.